welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Father, we thank you for this incredible privilege of being redeemed, saints of God, sons and daughters of the Most High God. And Lord, we're hungry and we're thirsty. This is Easter week, and Lord, we want to know him. We want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. So, Lord, we ask that you would teach us. This week, lead us by the hand, Holy Spirit. Bring us that which belongs to him, that we may grow and be the disciples that you need us to be in this age and in this hour. We thank you for every church that names the name of Jesus that's preaching the gospel this morning. Father, bless them. Thank you that we belong to a great and a mighty family of God, that there's a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, cheering us on. And, Lord, may our lives... And may this house bring joy and pleasure to you and to your heart. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the book of 1 Peter. And we're going to be looking at chapter 2, starting with verse 21. And the title of today's message is The Way Through Your Worst Day. The Way Through Your Worst Day. Now, life is filled with good days and bad days. I don't know why bad things happen to good people and why great things seem to happen to bad people. I don't have the answers for all of that. But I do know that there's not a day in all of eternity, there's not a day that will ever be on this planet or in the universe that will be worse than the day that the Lord hung on Calvary's cross. That is the ultimate worst day. And as the dying lamb was speaking seven things out of his heart, he was still and ever is the living word, and he was teaching us, taking us by the hand and leading us through the path that he had already paid for and the way through our worst days. And I want to show you something in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, I'll be reading out of verse 21. I just have to get there. For to this you were called, talking about actually suffering, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. So he's already paid a price and paved a path through his worst day, showing you and I how we can get through every dark day, every spirit of adversity, every difficult time that we're ever going to have, he's going to show us the steps to it. And I believe we can see it through the seven statements that he made at Calvary's cross on Good Friday. Are you ready? So we're going to do seven. We're going to go fast. And before we go to number one, let me just also say this to you, that when we come to the cross of Jesus Christ, we come in two ways. First, we come as sinners that need a Savior, every one of us. Born into sin, that's why he came. Every one of us born with a terminal blood disease called sin, born into it, born into slavery, into Satan's kingdom of darkness, not able to get out on our own. So we come to the cross as sinners, but we stand up from that cross as disciples. And so every one of us, if we are born of the Spirit of God, have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, We've been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of God. He has justified us just as if we've never sinned. He's cleansed us by his blood. He's presented us holy and blameless and spotless before the Father. And now he takes us by the hand and he says, children, you're going to have days that you wish you didn't have. You're going to have things in your life that you wish didn't happen. But as disciples of me, there are steps that I've given you and I need you to follow them. And the first one is forgive everyone who is ruining your life. Forgive everyone. And we find this in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus seems to be defeated. He seems to be in a defeated position, but he is actually in absolute control of the situation. And the first thing he does and the first thing he says is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
And the first step through my worst day, the first step through adversity, the first step through a difficult time, whether that day is a season or whether that day is 24 hours, whatever that day seems to be, the very first thing the Lord did is he released us into the forgiveness of God. He controlled the situation by not yielding to the situation. What do I mean by that? What you do not yield to will not be able to rule over you. Anger, antagonism, cruelty, betrayal. Jesus did not strike back in the flesh. He stayed and was the ever-living God as the dying lamb in the spirit. 1 Peter 2.23, we just read it, but let's read it again. It says, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. As long as I don't encounter in kind to anyone bet on my destruction, then they're not going to rule over me. And when I forgive, it is the bridge back into relationships. It's the way back into wholeness and reconciliation. There is no other way that you and I could have ever been saved, ever brought back to the Father if there was not forgiveness. If he had not released us at that cross into forgiveness, we'd still be stuck in our sins. Now, here we are, you and I, and these are, this is the pathway through the worst day. Step one, forgive everyone who is ruining your life. Forgive everyone that you need to forgive. Why? Because if you do not, you will yield to that power of revenge and retaliation and anger harassment and animosity you'll be rehearsing over and over again the things that happened to you and you will be stuck in a prison and there's nothing God can do for you because he said if you don't forgive you can't be forgiven we're handed over to the tormentors Satan has legal authority and legal right in my life if I do not release and forgive I can't forgive because I feel like it I forgive by faith because I've been forgiven of a $2 million, $4 million, $10 million, whatever that debt was that you find in Matthew chapter 18. Everything that's ever been done to me in comparison to what I've been forgiven, Jesus said, is like 20 bucks. And I can't hold on to that $20 debt because it'll throw me in prison and it'll give Satan legal right to torment my mind and my heart. And God showed us through the worst day of the universe, the first step is to release and forgive. You do it by faith. You don't do it by feeling. And by not retaliating, by not yielding to that which wants to control you, you overcome evil with good. Jesus released us into love and forgiveness, but he mastered the moment in doing so. You and I have got moments we must master in these dark times. In adversity and hard times, Satan wants us to run rampant and to get in the flesh and to get in fear and to get into frustration and to get back where there is no power, but there's a whole new power working at the cross. He came in a spirit of meekness riding on a donkey on Palm Sunday. He came and he revealed a whole new power that the world had never seen. Meekness, power under the love of God, power controlled by the love of God. And there the Lamb of God on that cross swallowed up the dragon. And he did it because the first thing he did is he released forgiveness. And he said, Father, forgive, for they don't know what they're doing. You and I are going to face families this week. We're going to be thrown into relationships because it's Easter and it's a holiday. You have opportunities to forgive and release, to build a bridge of love back into your families, back into those torn relationships, or you have an opportunity to stay in resentment, to stay in unforgiveness. It's our choice. But if we're going to walk in his steps, in his steps, the first thing is forgive everyone that's ruining your life. You know, when you stretch out your heart and you forgive, not by feeling but by faith, the power of God and the grace of God comes into your life and will forgive through you to that person. It's not by feeling. It's not because they deserve it. It's not because they're wonderful people or they've even asked forgiveness. It's because it's our pathway through our worst days. Number two, the next thing that Jesus did, he encouraged the thief at the cross. So number two for you and I, if you're taking notes, is encourage others who are going through hard times. My scripture is Luke 23, 43. The thief at the cross is speaking to the other. There's two people. There's one on his left and there's one on his right. Two separate men who are both guilty. Two separate people with separate reactions. The thief on his left says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, then save yourself and save us. And the thief on the right says, shut up and leave him alone. 
You and I are guilty. We deserve what we're getting. But this man is innocent. And he looks at the Lord and this is, and he says to the Lord, remember me, Lord. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this is what Jesus says. And then, can I have the scripture up on the overhead, please? This is what Jesus says. And Jesus said unto him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. There's the dying lamb, the living word, reaching out in his moments of excruciating pain and sin and betrayal and abandonment and shame. And there he is in his hardest moment, reaching out with the resources of heaven and encouraging and bringing somebody into life. What's that example to me in my worst day and in a difficult time? What's the point? The point is, is that there will be people in my life. There'll be people on my left and there'll be people on my right. There'll be people that will blaspheme God and they're going through a hard time. But there are the ones that'll be on my right. And God says, open your eyes and look, child. Because they do not have the resources that you have. And they're going through a difficult time just like you. And you've got the resources of heaven at your beck and call now. Because he went to the cross, you now have heaven's resources and the kingdom of heaven on the inside of you. And if you'll open your eyes, Debbie, and if you'll step out of your own misery and your own pain, and you'll look around, I'll send you people who need your encouragement and need your help and the resources that I've given you. And it'll bring them into wholeness as you're going through your hard time your hard time has purpose and one of the purposes of your hard time is to help somebody else when I step out of my misery and step into somebody else's my misery doesn't look so bad let me give you a word on this second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 Paul writing says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation, all of it, not some of it, all of it, that we may be able, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, I used to think, well, that means, God, I got to get through it first and have victory before I can comfort somebody else. And God said, no, look at the cross. They're both dying on that cross. And Jesus reached over, looked at that man and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. In the midst of my hell, in the midst of my worst day, in the midst of what looks like my defeat, in the midst of everything that's coming against me, God says, step out of your misery and understand that there's resources for you. And I put the kingdom of God in you. I put the power of God in you. I put the word of God in you. And re reach out and help somebody else because they don't have the resources you have. And when you do, child, you've just taken another step through your worst day. And you're getting to the other side. Number three, take care of your own family. Oh, my, my. Sometimes when I'm having a bad time or adversity, when things are, and there's pressure on me, when there's demonic things happening in my life, I want to just go home and vent and just have an attitude. I want to come to work and leave me alone. Fighting a fight of faith. We take out our worst moments on the ones that are closest to us. And Jesus models the steps through this by totally changing the scene. We're talking about John, the disciple, and Mary, his mother. And in John 19, 26, he's the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn in his family. Yes, he has brothers and sisters. They didn't believe him. And there's Mary, his mother. The mother of God is standing at that cross in the Simeon prophecy that a sword will pierce her heart. That sword is that cross, and it's breaking her heart right then and there. And he stops what he's doing, which is saving us on that cross. And he looks at John, and he says, John, behold your mother. He says to Mary, woman, behold your son. And he takes care of his family in the midst, in the midst of his worst moments. And the message to me is in my adversity, in the darkness of the hour, in the season that I may be walking through. God says, Debbie, take care of your family. You don't drop the ball. You don't release the responsibility just because you're having a hard time. There's enough grace. There's enough power. There's enough ability for you to go home and be the woman you're supposed to be, be the man you're supposed to be, be the example on the job. Don't take it out on your family when you get home. Don't presume that they can take your bad temper or your disposition or your depression. The way of a disciple, when I stood up from that cross and I was no longer a sinner, 
but I was now a saint when I stood up in that cross. And now I'm a disciple of God. The way of a disciple is to take care of the ones that I'm responsible for and the ones that I love. To take care of our families, our coworkers. Don't transmit our situations on them, but instead provide care. Provide that which God has called us to do. We don't let it down. We don't let it go. Number four, message from the cross, the way through our worst day. Ask God the hard questions. Ask God the hard questions. Ask God, not man, the hard questions. Because no matter how much man wants to help, and there's a season and there's a time for man to step in and encourage and help, but then there's a time when there is nobody that knows you and nobody understands you and nobody gets you or understands the ins and outs, the ups and downs, the visible and the invisible situation that you're going through. And you're going to have to ask God in the midst of your worst circumstance because Jesus says, and if I can have that scripture on the overhead, Jesus said, and this is where we're going, Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Now, I know two things are for sure. I know that God, number one, hears my cry. I know that my cry is not falling on deaf ears. And I know that my God will answer me because I know that my Savior, at that point in time, at that moment in time, all the sin of all the world and all humanity was now on him. He now was the scapegoat. He now was the spotless lamb. He now had the full sin of the world on him. And in Leviticus, God gives us a glimpse of what's happening. There were two. There was a goat that was to be killed, a lamb that was to be killed, and the blood was shed on the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant between the Holy of Holies. And there was a scapegoat that all the sin of Israel, the high priest would lay his hand on the Day of Atonement on that scapegoat. That's why it's called a scapegoat. And he would impart the sin of Israel on that goat, and they would lead that goat out of the camp into the wilderness. And here's the lamb fulfilling both things. His blood is being shed because he's about to take it to the highest seat, the mercy seat of heaven. And he's the scapegoat. Every sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed of mankind and humanity has now been laid on him. And for the first time in eternity, God the Father had to turn himself away from God the Son. I will never know the horror and the heartbreak of that moment when the Trinity, when the one who was with him in the beginning, wisdom himself, created all things. It says all things were created by him and for him. Without him, nothing was created, speaking of the living word, Jesus. Because he was willing, because he was the last Adam, because he fused with humanity and took on our nature, because he was the lamb of God that was dying on that cross, when he had the full brunt of the sin of the world on him, his father turned away and he cried out to God. He still said to his father, he still prayed, he still asked God the hard question, why have you forsaken me? And I know two things for sure. My cry will not fall on deaf ears. My God hears my cry. And my God will answer me. It may not be the answer I'm looking for or when I want it, but he will answer me. Because Jesus had to be abandoned into sin. And the sin of the world was upon the righteousness of God. And he became sin so you and I could be right with God. Because he was abandoned. Because he was no longer able to be with the Father. I can be with the Father for eternity. And when I'm in my worst day and I say, my God, my God, he has not forsaken me. He hears me. He lives to make intercession for me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. He said he'll freely give me all things because the son was willing to be separated and abandoned. Ask God the hard questions. You may not like the answer you're going to get or it may not come when you want, but God will answer you and God will tell us. Just like Job. Job said, God, I don't get what's going on. We don't see earth's side. You see, we see earth's side. He sees eternity. Whether our lives are long or whether they're short, there is purpose and there is destiny in everything that happens to us. And God has not left us or forsaken us. And when you cry out to God, he'll hear you and he will answer. Like he said to Job, who is this that darkens counsel? 
because Job and his friends just didn't get it. You see, man, you can talk about it with your friends. You can talk about it with your pastors. And there's a time and a season for that. But in the dark hours, when you're all by yourself, in your heart of hearts, you ask God the hard question. Because nobody knows you like he does. God said to Job, stand up like a man. God will answer you. And he'll show you who he is in your worst moments. Because he said to Job, he didn't answer Job's questions. He said to Job, Job, who is this that darkens counsel? Stand up like a man and let me tell you who I am, Job. Where were you, Job, when I called forth and spread forth the universe like a curtain? Where were you when I called forth Pallades and Orion and they sang the songs of creation as I brought forth the constellations? Where were you, Job, when I created the heavens and the earth? Where were you, Job, when I am God, Job, and I'll not leave you and I'll not forsake you, and I have your purposes at heart and at hand, and trust me, but ask me the hard questions. Number five, the next statement, after my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus said, I thirst in John 19, 28. After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst, I thirst. Number five is ask others for help. There is none of us that are so spiritual that we can do this by ourselves. God hasn't called me to do life alone. He has called me into a family. He's called me into a community of believers. He's called me to live life with you and for you to live life with me. And there Jesus is. He's about to say the last two things at that cross, commit his spirit to the Father. He's about to say it is finished and into your hands I commend my spirit. But right now he's been on that cross, the ninth hour. And the bodily fluids and the blood is drained out of him, and there is no moisture left. He's already refused the water before he was crucified. He's already refused it once because they didn't give him water. They gave him gall mingled with ma wine, which would cause him not to feel the pain as much. But he refused that. He refused it. But now here he is about ready to breathe his last, and he's got to say something. The living word has not yet finished speaking from the cross. And he says, I thirst. Clarity. When you and I are going through our worst moments and our worst times, we need to ask others for help, but we need to ask the ones that are going to help us the right way. He needed moisture. He needed water. They didn't give it to him. He refused it. What does that mean to me? How do I translate that into a step through my worst day? I need to ask people who are going to help me stay on that cross and finish my course and do what God's called me to do and not coddle my flesh, but provide an anchor of hope and faith with me to finish what God's called me to do. In your worst moment, you're going to want to abdicate. You're going to want to stop. You're going to want to back down. And there'll be people that'll want to coddle you and stroke your self-pity. And there'll be people that'll want to say, oh, no, this isn't God. You shouldn't be going through this. You shouldn't be doing that. Here, have a little wine. Coddling the flesh. But God says you need to ask for help from people that will give you the living water. The ones that will give you the help that you need. That will help you make the stand of faith that you've got to continue making until it's finished. You've got to stop and you've got to be able to ask for help and know and understand the ones that are going to help you the right way. Your best friends are not going to be the ones that are going to sympathize with you. Your best friends are going to be the ones that are going to say, buck up and shut up, stand up, shields up, swords out, kick some butt, keep going. It's not over till it's over. God's not finished and help you stand the test in a time of hardship. Ask somebody for help. But make sure you get the right help. You've got to clarify what you need. I need help from those who will help me with my faith, not my flesh. Number six, we're almost done. You doing all right? The steps for your worst day. Number six, what he said, John 19:30. He said, "It is finished. It is finished. Right after that, when he refused one more time the wine and the gall, 
He said, it is finished. So number six, point number six in steps through my worst day is declare your faith. Declare your faith. Let's just review for just a minute. Now, we've, we've forgiven everybody that we need to forgive. That's step one. I'm talking about steps through, the pathway through a hard time. Because we're all going to have them. We're all going to have times we don't want to walk through. He's already laid the path. He's paid the price, and he's laid the path for us. Forgive everybody that you need to forgive. Encourage others that are going through a hard time. Step out of yourself and step into somebody else because it's going to strengthen you. Take care of your family, number three. Number four, ask God the hard questions. Number five, ask for help. Number six, declare your faith because everything comes to pass. Did you get that? Everything comes to pass. Everything comes to pass. Nothing's going to stay the same. You're walking through. You're going through. You're not going to be on that cross forever. There's an end and there's a beginning. There's a purpose. There's a destiny. It may look like you are defeated. It may look like it's not going to happen. All your enemies may have ganged up against you. It may look like you have just been betrayed and you have failed. And where is God? And it looks like it's absolutely over. But I'm here to tell you, if you will stand and declare the end from the beginning, it is finished. He said, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I finished my course. I've saved humanity. It is finished. He declared the end from the beginning. And he said, he said, he said, he said, he said what he was supposed to say. He said his faith and what he was supposed to accomplish. It's done. Church, when you're in your worst moment, when you're about to die and you think there is no life left, you stand up and declare your faith because out of that death, Resurrection is around the corner, and life is around the corner. And it may look like you're defeated, but, oh, Sunday's coming, and there is life coming from that death. And, yeah, we pick up our cross and we follow him. But everything that dies in our life, everything that happens, every adversity, every wicked thing that hell brings against us, God says, if you'll take the steps with me, if you'll follow me in the kingdom, and you'll not go the way of the flesh, if you'll trust me, if you'll declare your faith, there's resurrection, there's restoration, there's life coming, there's life coming. Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. It's going to be done. It's going to be over. Declare your faith in the last one. Number seven, commit it all to the Father. Commit it all to the Father. Ultimately, now it's done. I have forgiven. I have encouraged I have taken care of my own. Oh, my gosh. I've asked God the hard questions. I've asked for help. I have declared my faith. Now I've got to commit it to God. He said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he breathes his last. What does that mean to you and I? It means ultimately, when it's all said and done, it's in God's hands. And I've got to learn to let it go and let God. I've got to learn to let it go and let God. Let it go and let God. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Can I have it up on the overhead, please? Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. That word anxious is don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known by God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and your lives in Christ Jesus. You'll guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. You know what God is saying? He's saying, pray about everything, worry about nothing. Pray about everything, but kids, worry about nothing. Pray about everything and worry about nothing. Because your worry can't change one thing, but your prayers and your faith can change your world. When we commit it to God, he's changing it. The price paid, the path laid. The dying lamb of God still speaking as the ever-living word of God at Calvary's cross.
seven things in his steps in our worst days. Forgive all, number one. Forgive everyone who's ruining your life. Oh, I'm believing for families to be restored, for steps to be taken, for you to step back into relationships that have been closed to you because of hurt and betrayal, because you become Christians and your families have shut doors on you. Oh, my, if you act like nothing's happened and just love them to lie, forgive them, step in. You know, I had somebody in my life that was just out of sorts with me, very close to me, not my immediate family, but somebody very precious to me. I couldn't get through. I couldn't get through. My heart was broken. God just said, don't stop. Forgive. God, I have to forgive all the time. He said, that's right. Every two minutes and 27 seconds, I told Peter, you just keep forgiving. You just keep releasing. You keep releasing. Don't let your heart get hard. Be tender hearted. And you know, I just took it on myself. I didn't know what to do because, you know, this person did not want to be with me. You ever been with people? They just don't want to be with you. It's like, get the clue. They don't want to be with you, so don't force yourself on them. Has anybody ever been there besides me? So I just decided to act like nothing had ever happened. And I just texted a few things and said a few things, and lo and behold, the door was opened. Lo and behold, love built a bridge. Lo and behold. You see, if you hold on to a grudge, if you hold on to the hurt, the offense, it won't build a bridge to anything, just walls of separation. Forgive everyone, everything. <laughs> Number two, encourage those who are suffering. They don't have your resources. They need you. Number three, take care of your own. Let's take care of our families and our friends and our loved ones. Number four, ask God, not man, the hard questions. Number five, ask for help. Make sure the help you get feeds your faith and not your flesh. Number six, Declare your faith because everything comes to pass. It may look like there's failure and death, but Sunday's coming. And number six, give it to God. Give it to God. Pray about everything. Worry about nothing. Will you stand with me? I want to do something. Steps through our worst day. I believe that there are people in here today, precious family members. You're my people. You're my, my church. It's my family. And I believe that God wants to, to do something in your heart, but you're going to have to give it to him. So this is what I want to do, and I hope you don't feel funny doing this, but I just want to bring this to a closure. We've done this in every service. I want you right now, if there's something in your life, a hardship, a trial, a test, a hurt, unforgiveness, whatever it is, I just want you to put it in your hand. Just put it in your hand right there, because we're going to pray. He said, cast your cares on him, for he cares for you. The enemy wants to tell you it's not going to happen. The enemy wants to hang you up to dry on a cross and tell you there's defeat and there's death, but God says, oh no, baby, there's resurrection coming, there's life, there's power, because he died for us. We can have healing where there's sickness. We can have wholeness where there's brokenness. We can see restoration where there's been devastation. Because of what he's done, we can have these things. But we have to ask, pray about everything, worry about nothing. So if you've got another hand free and you've got the worry that you've been worrying about, it, just put that in the other hand. There you go. you got two hands. Lift them up to God. There you go. Worry on the left, the care on the right. Are you ready? We're going to pray. We're just going to give it to God. Father, you said, here we are. We present ourselves at the 10 o'clock service of the rock, our family. We present ourselves in agreement as the family of God. First, we want to thank you for Jesus, that he has laid steps for us. He's made a pathway for us. Now, Lord, you said that we could pray about everything and we're to worry about nothing, and that you hear us and you give us peace and you answer our prayers. So, Father, we just release our worry right now. We cast it on you. We get rid of it. In Jesus' name, just throw it up to God because it's not going to do you any good. We just throw the worry up to you, and we release the care. We commit it to you. We thank you that you're working out all things to the good to those of us that are called according to your purpose. We thank you that no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. We thank you that you have a plan for good and not for evil. We thank you that we have the favor of God and you are working on our behalf. We thank you that you are reuniting our families, reconciling our relationships, healing our bodies, restoring our souls, that you're giving us favor, that you're giving us a spirit of generosity and you're giving us the resources we need to work the works of God in this generation with jobs and 
better jobs. And we thank you, Father. We refuse to worry. And we thank you this Easter. May it be the most amazing Easter we've ever walked in as we step in to the steps of Jesus this week. And all the saints of God said, amen and amen. But before we leave today, you've been great. It's been a great, great word. Don't you love our King? The living word ever teaching us, always leading us through, teaching us about his kingdom. I love it. Oh, my gosh, I just love it. But I'm not quite finished because I've got something I need to do, and it's probably more important for some of you than anything I've ever said. And I need to ask you a question, and it's a bit of a taboo. People don't like to talk about it. But I need to ask you about what would happen when you die. I mean, everybody's going to die. We're all going to die. It just happens. None of us can keep ourselves alive. Try holding your breath for five minutes. You can't do that. We cannot keep ourselves alive. Every one of us is appointed for a moment of death. But after that, what? What's going to be our eternity? Where are you going to spend eternity when you open your eyes after you've died? Because you're not just here for a moment. God's made us for eternity. Are you going to spend your eternity in God's heaven? Are you going to spend your eternity in Satan's hell? Because God did not make mankind for hell. He made hell for the devil and his angels. If you say, well, I hope I'm going to be in heaven, I need to ask you, what makes you think you're going to God's heaven? If you say, well, I'm a good person. Well, that's great, but God doesn't say, if you're good, you're getting to my heaven. God never said goodness gets him to heaven or gets me to heaven. Never said behavior modification is the way and the pathway to God. God said that my goodness is like a rag, a filthy rag to him. In comparison to his standard of holiness and goodness, I fall short. I can't make it. If you say, well, okay, I'm hoping I'm going to get to heaven. Well, God never said the best hopers are going to get to heaven. We don't hope our way into heaven. Well, Maybe you're saying, well, okay, I know that Jesus Christ is Lord. I know he's the son of God, and I've been a good person. But you see, thinking that Jesus is the son of God, knowing that he's the son of God, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to heaven because Satan knows he's the son of God. See, it's not what you have in your head. It's what you've done with your heart with Jesus. There's only one way to God's heaven, only one way. It's a narrow way, and it's his way, and he said you must be born again. He explained very clearly what born again was. Jesus explained it to a man named Nicodemus when he came to Jesus and asked him the question I asked you, how do I get to heaven? Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus was sincere. He was a rabbi. He was a famous rabbi, a brilliant man, a good man, fed the poor, clothed the naked, taught Israel. Yet he didn't understand this. And he said, I'm an old man. I can't. I can't be born in my mother's womb again. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, what is born of the flesh is flesh. You have a physical fleshly body, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. You are made in the image of God. Your spirit, made for eternity, has been separated from God by sin. That's called death, separation. That spirit, your spirit, must be born again. Nicodemus said, well, how is that going to happen? And Jesus said in John chapter 3, when he had this conversation with him, he said, there's a cross that I'm going to. Nicodemus, I'm going to be lifted up on that cross. And if you'll look with the eye of faith to that cross and you'll believe that I am who I said I am, all God and all man, the last Adam, the Lamb of God that has been brought forth, that I chose to come, God in the flesh, to save you because you can't save yourself. I alone can take on the sin of mankind. Mankind does not have that kind of life in them. And if you'll look to that cross and if you'll surrender and let me be Savior and Lord, believe. That's what believe is, surrender, committing my life to Jesus, letting him be my Savior and letting him be my Lord because Savior and Lord, which is king, go hand in hand. Lord means boss. If you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus, let him be Savior and Lord. Then God's brought you here today to change your destiny to let you have an opportunity to make that life an eternal decision. Are you born again? Have you surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, letting him be Savior and Lord? Some of you are saying, well, you know, I'm okay. I think I'm okay. And again, I have to tell you, in America, we've got this thing called lukewarm Christianity. We're a little in, we're a little out. We're a little up, we're a little down. 
Come to church sometimes. Come at Christmas. Come on Easter. But you see, we've never lived the life and we've never surrendered our hearts to him, really. And Jesus talks about that in the church at Laodicea. And he says, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Hot or cold, in or out, there's no in between. So if you've been in between and you're riding the fence, there is no fence to ride here. There's only one way. You must be born again. And that way comes through believing and surrendering. So I'm going to ask you to change destinies today. I'm inviting you. This is good news. The gospel means good news. The good news is you don't have to go to hell. The good news is you're made in the image of God. The good news is that God loved you so much he couldn't live without you. The good news is he's already paid the price. He's already done everything that has to be done so that you can get to God's heaven. You can be a son and a daughter of God. But God doesn't shove it down our throats. He doesn't make us do this because he can't. He's given us a free will. He says, make the choice. You choose. What are you going to do with my son? And what are you going to do with the cross? Are you going to surrender? Let him be God? Give it to God finally? Or are you going to sit back with a stiff neck and a prideful heart? Say, not yet. I'm not ready. No. And you see, that's what you're struggling with right now. That's why God brought you here today. He brought you here to change your destiny. Today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Today. So all over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never surrendered your heart and your life to him, let him be Savior first and Lord boss. I'm talking to you. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to hit that pulpit. We're going to raise our hands at the same time. And the reason we do that is because we understand something. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. We don't close our eyes and bow our heads. There's nothing wrong with that, but we don't do that here. We have to be under our own conviction. And we know that if you can't say yes to Jesus in this place and not be ashamed and not let embarrassment stop you, but say, yeah, I hear you, Deb. I hear you. I need a Savior, and he is it, and I need to get right with God. You cannot walk out those doors in a hostile world and live for Jesus. Don't let one moment of insecurity or embarrassment stop you from eternal destiny. Have you been running from God instead of to God? I'm talking to you. Have you backslidden? Maybe you served him at one time, but you have messed up so bad you don't trust yourself. Well, listen, he's bigger than your messes, and he's not shocked over your sin. And no, you can't serve him in your power, but he can forgive you, and he can wash you, and he can give his grace and change you from the inside out, and you can serve him in his power. He loves you. Maybe you've been that great religious person that's been at every service, carried your Bible, but you've never surrendered your heart in your life. He's talking to you today. All over this auditorium, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go bang, and we're just going to lift our hands. We're going to do it at the same time. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands all over this auditorium. I see that hand. There's one, two. Keep them high. Keep them high. Let me see. Three, four, five, six. Keep your hands high. Seven, I see that hand. Eight, I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? Okay, this is what we're going to do. You know, last week over 270 people came to the Lord. This week, we haven't had that many salvations. Now, I don't know if it's because I don't give such a great altar call. I don't know why it is. But I know this. I know that you're here today. That there's a God in heaven that died for you and loved you. You don't have tomorrow, but you got today. We got a letter from a man named Justin who was in this church two years ago. Wrote us a shout out. He's sitting in a federal prison right now for life because he was in this church. He said, I wish I would have gone forward that day because that week I shot a cop and I'm in prison for life. Now I'm saved, but I'll never marry the girl I was going to marry. I'll never have the life I'm going to have. Please tell your people today is a day of salvation. All over this auditorium. There are those of you that still need to come and get right with God. But I can't make you. I can only invite you to come and meet the man and know the God that has changed our lives and loves us so much that he couldn't live without us. That's all I can do. Will you stand with me if you raised your hand or if you didn't? Get out of your seats. Take everything that you brought with you to church. Come and meet me right at this altar. Let's get right with God as we sing this song. Come quickly. And let's get right. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus.
give you his he will give you his the great exchange the great exchange look at all of these beautiful young kids Easter 2013 Palm Sunday meeting Jesus for the first time you are not going to a funeral you are going to a birthday party you're gonna get born again so no frowns okay Smile at me with those big, beautiful smiles that he's given you. There they are. We love you. God loves you. We're going to take you into the New Believers room because we want to pray with you. We're going to tell you what you've done, pray privately with you. Your families can join you there. You won't be there very long. This is Pastor Joel. If you'll follow him, he's just going to lead you into our New Believers room. He's going to tell you some things that we're going to give you, some free stuff. Nothing costs anything. Salvation is free. It costs God everything but it's free to us. So if you make a left-hand turn, just go with Joel. 